Muito boa tarde a todos, sejam muito bem-vindos a mais um ciclo de webinars aqui no, no The Olympic Performance, hoje com um convidado uh, absolutamente especial, uh, um membro da Comissão Médica e Científica uh, do Comitê Olímpico Internacional, trata-se de Yanis Pitsiladis. Thank you very much, Yanis, for uh, accepting our invitation. It's really an honor and a privilege to have you here with us for such an important, for us it's very important, uh, Uh, issue about this uh, preparation towards Tokyo 2020 in 2021. Uh, so um, I will I will speak only a few words in Portuguese for all the all the attendees. Uh, eu diria que esta este é um momento bastante importante. Naturalmente que todos vivemos uh, uma situação uh, relacionada com a pandemia que naturalmente que nos coloca uma enorme incerteza. Uh, em toda a nossa preparação. Sabemos bem os tempos difíceis e em certeza também todos aqueles que estão neste momento quer a preparar a, prepara a participação nos jogos, quer também a preparar uh, a, a mesma a qualificação, no caso dos atletas que ainda não estão qualificados e uh, temos naturalmente muitas esperanças que isso possa vir a acontecer, mas esta incerteza de facto coloca-nos a todos uh, imensos desafios e é por isso que cá estamos e introduzindo também o ciclo que hoje começamos com uma abordagem integrada do planeamento do, para os Jogos Olímpicos de Tóquio e o doutor Yanis Pizziladis pediu então também para de alguma forma reforçar que esta, esta não vai ser uma, uma apresentação normal com princípio meio e fim no fundo acaba por ser uma integração de todas as áreas do planeamento. Na próxima semana vamos ter uma, uma apresentação também que eh, considero muitíssimo interessante e importante, uma vez que o chefe de missão eh, de Portugal, a Tóquio 2020, o Marco Alves, conjuntamente com o Dr. Gomes Pereira, que são, é o diretor, diretor de Medicina Desportiva, irão dar uma perspectiva daquela, ou daquelas que vão ser, as, as, no fundo, os procedimentos de, relativamente ao contexto da missão de Portugal aos Jogos Olímpicos de Tóquio. Já vamos de alguma forma levantar um pouco do véu daquilo que já podemos, outras coisas naturalmente devido às questões de incerteza que temos ainda não é possível. Depois no dia 16 de fevereiro a psicóloga Ana Bispo Ramires irá falar sobre a gestão de incerteza em contexto de Covid, como potenciar a performance rumo a Tóquio 2021 e depois em 5 de março a nutrição, hidratação e suplementação serão os temas da, 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 da ação da nossa nutricionista Cláudia Mindrico. Finalmente teremos uma mesa redonda com quatro treinadores de excelência, a Normigo, Carlos Cruxinho, João Abrantes e Rui Fernandes, que eh, irão certamente terminar de uma, com chave de ouro este mesmo ciclo. Sem muitas de, demoras, vou então passar a apresentar o nosso convidado de hoje, Dear Yanis, sorry for that, only for introducing all the cycle, and now I have to introduce yourself, because your curriculum is so Uh, so uh, big it's uh, it, it, we, we, we could be all the session here talking about you and uh, it's really a privilege and I, I should say something about you Professor Yanis Pizziladis has a, an established history of research into the importance of lifestyle and genetics for human health and performance following 15 years at the University of Glasgow Scotland where he created the largest known DNA biobank from world-class athletes he was appointed in 2000 2013 Professor of Sport and Exercise Science in the University of Brighton. Current research priority is the application of omics, genomics, uh, transcriptomics, metabolomics and proteomics, well, you know much better than me about this, to the detection of drugs in sports in, with particular reference to the recombinant human erythropoietin, blood doping and testosterone. His most recent research is funded by the World Anti-Doping Agency, WADA, and by the International Olympic Committee, IOC, uh, where he is a currently member of the IOC Medical and Scientific Commission, and a member of the Executive Committee of Chair and Scientific Commission, uh, International Sports Medicine Federation, and a lot of other uh, federations and, and, <laughs> and institutes. Uh, he is a member of almost uh, all, all institutes connected with, with sports medicine. And he published more than uh, 185 peer-reviewed papers. He is really a reference in this area. Thank you very much, Dr. Yanis, for being with us. It's a really a huge privilege. It's very important for us, uh, you know, that uh, your, 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 your presentation and uh, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me share my slides and you just let me know if it works and then I'll get started. Let me tell me if you can see my first slide. Yes. 
Pedro, can you see that? Yes, yes, absolutely. Okay. So, boa tarde, and that's the only Portuguese I know. Um, it's a real, real pleasure to be here with you today. Um, and I thank my friend Pedro for this uh, very, very beautiful uh, introduction. As you can see from my title there, um, an integrated planning approach towards Tokyo Olympic Games, I'm gonna try and bring together all the important aspects we need to consider as we move towards an Olympic Games. And also, as you can see there in red, I'm talking about also some future considerations in terms of also using the Tokyo Games as a means to prepare for the next games. Um, I've underlined the word integrated because I'm gonna to bring together all the aspects that I said to you that are important. And in some way, what I'm gonna try and convince you to do and what I'm gonna try and do today is actually be a conductor. And the idea, as you can see here from the very famous um, uh, conductor, Gregor Nowak, is to try and orchestrate everybody to work together towards a similar direction, which is success um, uh, in, a, in a major competition, the Olympic Games. Those of you who are not musical, uh, well, another equivalent would be going to a, a fine restaurant. If it wasn't for COVID, I'd hope that we, I would be with you in potentially in Lisbon and going to a restaurant like that of Belcanto with a very famous chef like uh, Jose Aviles. Um, and what I'm gonna try to do today is do something similar and give you a tasting menu where the seafood, for example, may be the altitude training, the meat dishes may actually be how to best acclimatize for the heat. And so I'll be jumping in and out of the different dishes um, because I'll try and integrate everything together. That's what I'm gonna try and achieve today. And I've been given about an hour and 10 minutes to do that. Hopefully a good time at the end for questions. Before I get started, it's very important, however, that I, I declare my potential conflicts of interest. Um, I have three potential ones. I'm founder of Human Telemetrics, um, founder of the Athlum uh, project, um, and also founder of the Sub2 project. And just to say the Sub2 Foundation, which I founded, has received some funding from Morton, uh, Sweden. Um, and also finally, the Sub2 project I founded has nothing to do with Nike or the Nike Breaking 2 project, just to be very clear on that. So let's get into the, 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 the summary of what I'm gonna try and talk about today. I'm gonna to start off with some background and background of a journey, because a lot of what I'll talk about today relates to also my own personal journey. Um, and uh, therefore I will talk about those aspects that I think are important for you, for your different federations uh, moving forward, but also based on my own personal experience as a scientist, but also as, a, as um, someone very interested in performance and having supported athletes successfully going to world championships and Olympic games. So I'll start off with the background, then how to prepare for the worst, uh, plan for the best. You know, so uh, it's really important that you prepare for the worst in order to be able to plan for the very best. And that's what I'm gonna stress for most of my talk. I'm then gonna talk a, a bit about uh, techno, to be a technophile, which basically means to be a friend of technology rather than to fear technology. So not, not to be a technophobe and how technology, if used wisely, can actually help us. Um, uh, in addition to the eyes of a good coach, how can we use technology to really help us? And I'm gonna end with the most important part really, which is that if we can utilize all these different aspects, integrate them nicely as, a, as an orchestra would do, as a, uh, as a conductor would do, or a good chef would do, and our athletes, our stakeholders, our team believe in what we're doing, then success is going to happen. So belief is very, very important. So that's, my, that's really what I'm trying to do today. And I wanna start off because I'm also known for having very long presentations and I may not get to the acknowledgements. And I must acknowledge um, uh, the IC Medical and Scientific Commission for nominating me to give this lecture to you as well. Um, but in particular as well, this uh, IOC Weather Impact Ex Expert Group, which I've sat on in the, for the last few years leading up to Tokyo. 
And in particular, my good friend who chairs the expert group, Sebastian Racinet, uh, who, whose material, some material, I will be presenting to you today. Um, so I'm particularly grateful for him. Um, and in one sense, we could almost be, think of it almost as doing a, a presentation from all these experts, and as, as in particular, Sebastian. Um, also, what I'm going to do today, I'm going to direct you to this document. Um, uh, and I'll end off uh, my presentation today with the, the website with, that you can actually download. And I, I'm pretty sure a lot of you, if not most of you, have already seen this uh, document, Beat the Heat, that was drafted by this expert group. We are very proud of this, this document. Um, and I'll illustrate many of the issues that this, this document raises with pertinent examples leading up to Tokyo or examples that um, uh, I've experienced over the years, um, going right back in the early 2000s and moving forward. So I'll jump in and out of the document. Um, and uh, if this was, if you were my students, uh, this would be the recommended reading prior to sitting the exam. Don't worry, there's no exam or anything like that. But this is the document that I would like you to look at, but I will, because um, I already expect you to have read this, I will jump in and out um, with other examples I mentioned to you and bring together other important topics. Um, because what we are really talking about today is how do we successfully get to the games, compete with, with the, the result that we want, um, cope with the heat, but cope with everything else that we're having to do as well. Um, that's why this document is going to be so very important. And in case anyone uh, thinks this may not be important, and I, you, you are already, I'm speaking to the converted because you're here today, because you know this is important. Um, uh, but just to illustrate that despite this being so very important, it's quite scary to think that, on, uh, that in Beijing 2015, only 15% of athletes had a dedicated heat acclimation period of for five to 30 days. And then moving to 2016, the numbers improved, but only 38% had a dedicated heat acclimation period of five to 30 days. So better, but if you think about it, still 62% are going to these games not prepared for the conditions. Doha 2019, and I had a chat just before we started this um, uh, webinar with Pedro, about his experience of having attended the Doha 2009 World Championships. And you can see only 55% had a dedicated heat acclimation period of five to 30 days. So for some reason, about half of the athletes going to important games like these are actually preparing for those conditions. And hence the documents, uh, this education that we are doing here today, the Beat the Heat uh, as an example of all its top hits are so very important. And that's also the reason why uh, I think Pedro's invited me today uh, to give this uh, webinar. And I'm gonna start with some background to, my, to, to areas of my interest and you'll see where I'm going with this. Starting off from the Rio Olympics in 2016. And here you can see the gold, silver and bronze for men for the 1500 meters to the marathon at the top and women 1500 to the marathon. And if I populate the results, have a look at something. Here are the results from the Kenyan athletes. Um, and don't worry about the Bahrain and, and USA flag. These are Kenyan athletes. And if I add the Ethiopian athletes, that for this small part of Africa, East Africa, 20 of the 30 medalists are from this one region of the planet. If I then add Mo Farah's uh, goals, uh, as you all know, Mo Farah uh, grew up in uh, Somalia, in East Africa. Then we add the um, athletes of African origin from Algeria and France. You will see that only three uh, uh, US athletes of European ancestry, one of New Zealand ancestry are the male athletes that got a medal who are not of African ancestry. And in the women events, only two Europeans. What does this mean? And you'll see where I'm going, why this is important moving forward towards Tokyo. In Doha, Pedro and I and others would have seen the same thing. 
In the men's event, only one European athlete highlighted here in circles and three European female athletes here. What is going on? What should our, what should European athletes or Asian athletes or other ancestries or ethnicities think? Pointless going to the games, at least in athletics, we have no chance. And certainly in other sports, you have other dominations of other ethnic groups. So this has led to many believing that white men can't run. And obviously this is from the movie, white men can't jump, obviously. And this typically, the stereotypical myth can be very bad if you're not of an African ancestry, but very good at the same time, if you are of African ancestry, because that gives you already belief that you have something special. Let's listen to a very young Usain Bolt, what he at least thought at the early stages of his career as to why Jamaica has produced so many great athletes. Because as you all know, and I know that we have a number of um, great athletes listening to us today, what makes you great in your sport is because you believe in what you are doing. You believe you can be the best. And that's why in my presentation, the last section is about belief. But let's listen to what you're saying thought as the reason why he and others of Jamaican ancestry are the best sprinters. Sleeves strong and they run about a lot because they domination by white and stuff like that. That's what most people say. That's why Jamaica are so talented in track and field. So in other words, what he's saying and other uh, great athletes in Jamaica have said the same thing to me is that they believe they have special genes that make them better than everyone else. And clearly if an athlete believes something really works in this case, the fact that he has the right genes, you as a coach don't want to change that or someone involved with the team uh, if the team believes that, and I'll come back to that issue. But at the same time, what does, what does the scientific evidence tell us? And I, this is not the topic for today, but, and I don't expect you necessarily to read this, but this is from a, the IOC Encyclopedia on Genetics and Molecular Aspects of Sports Performance. And basically what, what we can conclude from this research, which has really excited me for many years, over 20 years I've been roaming the world, collecting DNA and studying these great athletes is that there's no evidence of superior genetics, none. And the same applies that there's no reasons why African swimmers can't excel in terms of biology. So there's no such thing as superior inferior genetics in terms of your race. The same applies to, to Asian athletes, Japanese athletes, and I was uh, very uh, honored to be in Athens and watch Mizuki Noguchi win, the, um, win gold in the Athens Olympic marathon in 2004. Um, even in terms, I've often heard that uh, Indians, Indian uh, individuals, you know, can't sprint or can't do well in sport. Well, the older people who are listening to this webinar may remember the Usain Bolt of the 1950s. His name was Serafino Antao. You can see this newspaper clipping here. He ran in 9.5 seconds, uh, the 100 yards as, as it was called. Um, he was Indian, but grew up in a different environment. He grew up in Kenya. Um, so just to be very clear here, your genetics are important as we know, not necessarily linked to your race, but linked to your parents, what we inherit. Um, and the reason I started off this point of the talk is to illustrate that don't believe in stereotypical myths. What you believe in, what the supporting team believe is vital for your athletes, or you've lost even before you started your competition. And keep in mind that the best do not win all the time. Those who win are those who best prepared. So that is really the first point or the first bit that I wanted to just to to share with you so in terms of background is a little bit of my background in terms of my interest, how these stereotypical myths are typically bad news for us because often the athlete or the entourage may have lost the competition and be going for the games to become second, third, fifth, 25th because I have no chance to compete against other ethnic groups, et cetera, et cetera. No, these stereotypical myths as the term myths uh, tells us are not based on any facts. And the important bit 
is how to prepare. And that brings me to the main part of my presentation, which is prepare for the worst, plan for the best. And I'm really gonna stress that now in, in um, uh, most of the time that I have. And again, talking about my journey and my own story, this is a very young Yanis. My hair hasn't changed in terms of its length, but changed in terms of its color. Um, back in 2007 in the world championships um, in athletics. And by the way, I know that we, I'm not only talking to athletics, uh, individuals from the athletics from all different federations. Don't worry, this will not only be about athletics. I'm just trying to illustrate with some examples that tend to come from athletics, but I will be jumping around to many different sports. So just, just bear with me. But I was invited um, uh, to Mombasa to those World Cross Championships to talk about another topic of great interest to me, which I will talk about a little bit today too, is nutrition for athletic performance and lessons from Africa. And that is what I was doing the day before the cross country championships. Um, then the next day were the cross country championships. And I, for those of you who don't remember, who weren't there, maybe some of you were there, I'd like you all to watch this very short video clip that illustrates some of the potential problems that we could be facing in Tokyo uh, or indeed in four years down the line in Paris at the Paris Olympic Games. And so watch the short video. Um, and, and as I said, we will dissect this as well in the presentation, but also potentially in the questions. We can go a little bit further back in the field to see if uh, Korek Wiang actually continued, because remember, it's four to count in the team. So we've got to look to see. Now, is she there? No, four, five, four. Let's see who is. Well, this is one of the Ethiopians. Four, zero, one. Ah, that's Eta of Ethiopia, who really thought she'd finished. Here he is. Here's yes. the defending champion. Now, she knows that she's got a run pull because they're four to win the team event. She's really got a motor. She's in desperate trouble. She really is. Uh, you could see she's stopping. She's falling down. My, what's happening? She's a defending champion. Oh, this is, we said that uh, there would be problems, we thought, for the Europeans, but medical service needs to get to this young woman quickly. She is in desperate trouble, and now they've got to her. She's absolutely suffering from heat exhaustion, and that really is a sad, sad sight. A totally misjudged race, um, and lots of errors, but she's obviously panicked, tried to run too fast in this heat ball, and has allowed the rest to get away, but Lynette Barassa now moving away. What a situation. So what you would have seen is what happened to the, 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 the favorite on the day, um, Corinne Wag. And so that was pretty distressing to watch in terms of her race. But some of you may have watched towards the end of the clip on the right-hand side, this athlete here lying collapsed on the ground. And um, uh, I didn't get a chance before the presentation to speak to um, uh, Pedro to find out is this a Portuguese athlete I'm not so sure maybe during the question time we can talk that seems to be the the, the colors of Portugal I'm not so sure I looked at the um, the the race participants and there was one Portuguese I, I don't that, think so I don't sorry? think so you don't, I don't think, think so, so. yeah Okay, there was a Portuguese runner who, uh, a young lady who withdrew or did not finish. Her name, I checked her out, was uh, Joanna Costa, but it may not be her. I'm not saying it is. All I'm saying is, point, I'm just going to point out to you that there's a, an athlete lying on the ground there. No one is getting to her. And clearly, if this is heat stroke, heat stroke which most likely it could be, um, we know that if not treated in 30 minutes, the effects could be permanent, if not treated in an hour to an hour and a half and not cooled down, the end result typically is death. So, you know, I'm not here to scare you in any way, but you can see the impact it can have on performance and also in health. And, and, and maybe uh, we can clarify who that athlete actually was, okay? But you, I think you're getting my point of me showing you that. In the same day, the, we, I had also gone particularly to watch one of the, if not the greatest uh, middle distance and long distance runners of all time, Kenisa Bekile won the race. He was, he was, for him, he just had to attend, do what he, was, what he does best, and he was going to win that race. He was, his own competitor really on the day was, was Cezanne Tedesse. You can see however the conditions that I've already alluded to, greater than 30 degrees Celsius, greater than 90% humidity. And the end result was that he didn't finish. 
On the day, the favorites didn't win that race. The athletes that won the races on the day were African athletes that trained in Europe and were aware of the need to acclimatize or acclimate. And so the best athletes in this occasion, the ones that were defending champions, for example, hadn't prepared for those conditions and ended up not completing or in worse, potentially being in a situation of, of getting some uh, you know, uh, life-threatening and career-ending uh, outcomes. And later on in the post-race interview, you can see the headlines here, how and why the Ethiopian challenge melted away in Mombasa. I had the, I had the uh, fortune to actually be with the Ethiopian team before the start of the race. And I watched, I wasn't, in, I wasn't involved in the team, I was just watching, I was an observer. And I remember big buckets of ice that Kenanisa and the other athletes were just rubbing on their body with ice. And that was the pre-cooling and the only aspects that they had actually thought of in terms of preparing the team, putting some ice on themselves, rubbing it on their body, and that was it. And if you look at the post-race quote from Kenanisa, I did my best, but I didn't want to faint and ruin the future as well. So you can see what I, the, um, you know, the, 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 the first important message here is what can go wrong in if we don't prepare for the conditions. And I want to introduce to you global sports communication because a lot of my experience are owed to the fact that uh, this gentleman right on the far left, Jos Hermans, who's an Olympian, um, uh, as well as once had the one hour world record, um, uh, um, his company that he founded, this was a celebration back in 2016 of 30 years of him managing some of the best athletes in the world, some of whom you can see actually figuring there in this uh, uh, slide. Um, uh, the great Haile Gabriel Selassie, uh, you can see Eli Kipchoge's coach in, uh, in Patrick uh, Sang um, over here. You can see also Lord Ko, Sebastian Ko, the president of World Athletics and other Olympians, and then on the far right, myself. I felt very privileged to be at, to attend this uh, event, um, but I'm just stressing this because I was at those World Championships, also invited by your ceremonies to uh, observe the preparation of some of these athletes in the Ethiopian team, especially. And after that disaster, that catastrophe in Mombasa, I was invited by your ceremonies and my team um, I, at that point, I was director of a, a center called the International Center of East African, African Running Science, where we're trying to understand what makes these athletes great. And we prepared this, uh, this project called the Global Gold Project. By failing to prepare, you're preparing to fail. The quote by the famous uh, philosopher, politician, scientist, Benjamin Franklin, who founded the, the USA, um, who, who said this very profound statement. And remember, these cross-country championships were in 2006, sorry, 2007. And the idea was the world championship was late on in that year. Also, there was Beijing the following year. What could we do to reverse the situation? Um, and it, it leads back to the point I made at the beginning of my talk that think also about uh, Tokyo games as also the preparation for the next games. So doing a lot of what you're probably already doing, and a lot of what I'll reinforce today is also in preparation for the next games, okay? In this case, Osaka and, and Beijing. And now I'm jumping back into the, um, uh, the pamphlet that I mentioned to you before, because in that pamphlet on page five, it talks about how does heat affect performance? And it refers to the work of a guy who looked at world championships from 1999 to 2011 and looked at uh, performances for under 25 degrees Celsius to plus 25 degrees Celsius. And what they found was that in the short events, 100 meters to the 400 meters, being in greater than 25 degrees Celsius environment, as a lot of you will know, actually enhanced performance. While being in con uh, conditions of greater than 25, in events from 800 meters to the marathon, dramatically reduced performance, especially in the marathon by 3%, as you can see. 
And that is a, that's a serious amount of performance decrement. Um, and then more recently, Sebastian Resenet, and I'd like to uh, acknowledge him here and his team, they looked at all the world championships going back to, to 1983 until 2017, and all the games during the same period of time, so, so nine summer games, and they plotted the same kind of data. And what you can see here in green are the track, mainly track events, and you can see they're in green, which means that they weren't affected by being at higher than 25 degrees uh, Celsius ambient conditions. And performance decrements began really at the 10,000 meters and then a 20 kilometer road walk and the marathon and the 50K road, road walk. Uh, that is where the impairments really happened. And the impairments were roughly the same at that point. So going for longer or further distance um, didn't make a difference. That is actually where, actually it's not further distance anyway, but um, th that is the, um, uh, what he showed there. I also want to point out that because many of you or some of you listening today, maybe from those events in the, that are highlighted in green, that does not mean that, okay, you can, you can leave the webinar preparing for these conditions are not important for you because actually for you, your athletes will perform better because of those conditions. That is not the case. Because if you aren't prepared for those conditions, you'll arrive at the games, you'll be, you'll be training in the days leading up to the games, you won't be used to those conditions, you will suffer uh, you know, a thermal stress from training and, and, and being in those conditions. That kind of exhaustion that will set in will have an impact on your performance and therefore not being able to compete at your very best on race day, on race days. So everything I'll talk about, everything that's in this pamphlet um, is relevant to all athletes, irrespective of whether the, the warmer conditions are seen favorably by the athletes or not. And I just wanna stress that point uh, because it's a really important point. Then jumping out of, the, um, out of the pamphlet and to try and illustrate some of those examples that are in that pamphlet, how does heat affect performance? Well, what we as scientists do normally, you can see the little video on the right-hand side, is we bring athletes into a laboratory in a heat room and, uh, in, where we can actually change the temperature of the room. In this study here conducted um, by Galloway and Morn uh, when I was doing my PhD back in the late 90s in Aberdeen in Scotland, you can see having someone, as you can see in this video, cycling until they they can't cycle anymore. That's why it's called time to exhaustion in minutes. And you can see at four degrees, 11 degrees, 21 degrees and 31 degrees. And you can see that time to exhaustion is very much influenced by the temperature. With the slowest time at 31 degrees Celsius, 51.5, and the longest or the best performance at 93.52. And you can see they're doing exactly the same amount of work it's exactly the same athlete in the same conditions. Um, uh, and you can see 40 odd minutes difference because of those conditions. So that is what heat can do. And that is also why, and this is the kind of data that explain why, for example, Eliud Kipchoge, Kenisa Bekile, when they attempted the world record and, and when Eliud actually broke the world record here in two hours, one minute, 39 seconds, he did that in Berlin where the temperature was roughly uh, closer to 11 than 21, so somewhere in between there. And had the conditions been even colder, maybe closer to 11 or at 11, he may have even performed even, he would perform even better. So this is what the impact temperature has on performance. Jumping back into the, into the pamphlet. So what can we do about it? Well, again, I want you to read the pamphlet. I'm not gonna read this out to you because I want you to do this after the, the, uh, the webinar. It talks about um, what happens over a number of days of acclimation. So adjusting oneself to those hot conditions and the adaptation which happens. And you can see in different colors, you have exercise performance or capacity, thermal comfort, how we feel, the sweating rate, what happens to sweating rate, skin temperature, body temperature, heart rate, what happens to the amount of blood volume we have, which is called plasma volume. Um, and again, I want you to read this in your own time, but I'm gonna illustrate this by going straight to the science that underpins 
this pamphlet and what a lot of you know. And the science behind this is very interesting. And I want to bring you back to 1993, the work of Bodil Nielsen. And if you look on the left hand side, this is just one characteristic example, one subject, one individual who, and this is temperature on the y axis and time uh, on the x axis. And you can see that straight line going up is an athlete who comes in and does um, uh, a session in the lab um, in a hot room. And then uh, days later, 10 days later, comes in and does a second session in the lab. And you can see temperature rises to the same amount. No benefit over nine days. And you can see over the nine days, this individual has just been sitting in a room 18 to 20 degrees Celsius, not acclimatizing to the hot conditions. Now, if we look at athlete B now, who over the nine days, you can see the first time they go to the lab and you can see they, they feel exhausted after 40 minutes. The second one, they reach the same body temperature at 41, third at 45, six at 60. The 10th session, they reach exhaustion. This is the same amount of exercise at 70 minutes. In other words, no conditions have changed. The conditions are exactly the same, but just by doing the same work in that hot room uh, for 10, ti 10 times, and we're talking about doing this in at 40 degrees Celsius room. And in one sense, we're simulating the experiment I showed you before. So they've gone from 51 minutes, for example, to the performance you'd expect at 11 degrees. And the only thing they've done is gone into the laboratory, into this hot room for 10 sessions. And you can see how quickly these dramatic effects can occur. Now, the coaches who are watching us, they will know that for you as a coach to get this kind of benefit, which is 10, 15, 20%, it's impossible to do that through the best training, to the best supplements, to the best of everything. So that is why uh, Pedro, myself, this, the series that you've got have stressed so much the conditions. Because if you do everything else perfectly well, but you don't prepare for these conditions, you've just been wasting your time doing everything else perfectly well. Because the, the effects here are so profound and I hope I've made that clear. But let me show you some other examples of, of how heat acclimatization, how it really works. And again, this is from work uh, looking at uh, cycling time trial performance, a uh, study published very recently by uh, my friend Sebastian, um, where what he did was he took elite cyclists, they came to uh, Doha and they did a, a, a time trial in the heat. Um, uh, and you can see how their performance uh, was very much reduced. The power output was very much reduced compared to the black line, which is their best performances in a cool environment. Then after one week of acclimation, they, they gain almost half that performance loss just in one week. And then after two weeks of training in that environment, they actually return back to the same performance that they were able to achieve in the cold. And now I think you can, with the data I showed you before from Bodil Nielsen's experiment, you can understand now how that has happened. In a short period of time, just two weeks, all that performance decrement has been restored. And this is very, very profound. I'm sure all of you agree. And we, let's build it even further. If we look on the left-hand side here, and this is also slides that have have been provided to me or adapted from Sebastian's presentation uh, that he gave to the European Athletics Federation. Uh, you can see on the left hand side here, this is sprint triathlon. And this, uh, these are two races that happened uh, in December 2006 versus February 2007. The conditions were identical on race day. You can see 28.1 degrees Celsius versus 27.4 degrees Celsius. But triathlon won occurred at the beginning of the summer. So the days beforehand had been quite cool. This is the first heat wave. And you can see that the athletes weren't accustomed to those, that hot weather because it was the beginning of the summer. And 15 suffered from heat illness. And in terms of heat stroke, 
uh, severe collapse, there were three suffering from heat stroke. Look what happened now, a few months later, exactly the same conditions, um, but in the days and weeks before, very hot conditions, no one had any problems. You can see the impact of acclimatization preparing for those conditions, um, how vital that is. And I know that uh, today attending also from the Volleyball Federation, well, look on the right-hand side, and this is again data from Sebastian recently published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine, where they look at um, analyzing uh, 11 years of heat stress data uh, from beach volleyball. And these are the incidents of uh, heat-related illness. And you'll see when they've occurred. They've occurred predominantly in the third and in the fourth quarter in particular. You can see where they've tended to happen. Uh, they've happened predominantly in Asia. Uh, and here you can see actually who the, which countries the athletes were from. They were mainly from uh, Eastern Europe. Um, uh, and you can see the conditions. The conditions were very much looking at um, uh, wet bulb, global temperature. You can see the kind of temperatures here ranging from anywhere between 20 all the way up here to close to 36 uh, wet bulb global temperature, which is the, the temperature that, that we tend to use. Uh, and I'll, I may come back to that later on explaining what that means. Um, and the conclusion these authors reached was that the higher rate um, of this heat illness um, uh, in the fourth quarter could be that players living in the North Hemisphere would not benefit any more of seasonal acclimation. Indeed, all of these um, uh, cases were from the fourth quarter in Asia, mainly in Thailand, with players from Europe, North and Eastern Europe. So you can see, uh, so these medical rate timeouts which were occurring um, uh, were happening predominantly to athletes who are not used to being in those conditions. Um, and I think this again is very, very profound data illustrating the, port the importance of why we need to acclimatize. Again, let me jump back into our pamphlet. And you can see here on page three, we, we talk about preparing for those conditions. And here you can see some data for the typical weather conditions from the 24th of July to the 9th of August. And you can see what happens to relative humidity as well as temperature. And by the way, we mustn't only talk about temperature. Actually, humidity is even more important than the temperature because it's not about how much we sweat, but, but we cool ourselves by the sweat evaporation. That is what's really important. Um, but I'll jump out of the, of the pamphlet again, because what those are general comments. We need to be looking specifically at our different sports. And um, Pedro shared to me that one of the seminars that you've done, uh, the meteorological uh, organization in, in, in Portugal has done an incredibly good application for you that you should use, and I won't spend more time on that, but that, that kind of application is going to be vital so you can get information that relates to you, especially during the lead up to your, to your competition. But this data is also available. You can see here, there's some data from Tokyo 2020 on the different sites and the web, uh, wet bulb global temperature, which basically is the temperature that is used when we take into account the temperature, the humidity, um, uh, also airflow um, uh, as well. And that's, that's the kind of what, uh, information that we use to really determine um, the, the heat stresses of the environment. Um, uh, so it's important that you prepare for the conditions that you're going to face. And in particular, preparing for the worst conditions that you will face. Here again from Tokyo 2020, for two years uh, in 2017 and 2018, for all the, the equivalent days of the Olympic games, you can see the, the fluctuation in temperature. Uh, worst case scenario uh, up here, you can see in red to the best case scenario, the gray area is where there's gonna be competition in the Olympic stadium. Um, uh, and you need to do, you need to look at this data for your particular event, for your particular sport, and as I indicate here, prepare for the worst conditions, not for the best conditions that you expect. If you get better conditions on the day, that's, that, is, that, is, that is great, but be prepared for the worst conditions. And if 55% of your competitors are not gonna prepare for the worst conditions, then actually you should want it to be the worst conditions because that means you will have an advantage. 
So you should be thinking about yourself, your athletes, focus on preparing for the worst conditions. Jumping back into the, the pamphlet, well then how do we best prepare? How do we acclimatize, uh, especially if we are from a colder country or in a country where those conditions are not gonna be at the time of preparation for the competition are not gonna be as severe. And I'm gonna home into um, uh, this diagram because this is particular, particularly useful. And I just want at this stage just to briefly explain the difference between acclimatization versus acclimation. Acclimatization is when we use the natural environment. So training in, a, in an environment which is hot and acclimation is what I tend to do as a scientist create artificial environments. And again, I'll let you read the pamphlet um, uh, in terms of the different type of examples that, that, are, that you could use. You could use either acclimati acclimatization or acclimation. But for my, uh, um, uh, using the example of the, the, the Osaka 2007, Beijing 2008, I chose the acclimation route. And you'll see shortly why I chose the acclimation route. What are the conditions in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, the, the exact dates years before Osaka World Championships? And here you can see temperature on the, on the, uh, on the y-axis, 2006, 2005, 4, 3, 2, 1. I looked at the six years beforehand. My athletes at the time were going to compete either at 5 o'clock, if it was qualification, or at 10 o'clock in the evening. So I needed to know uh, or they were going to do training at that time, the conditions at that particular time. And you can see the average uh, for each year, uh, 4, 5 p.m. and 10 p.m. And you can see in blue the average for Addis Ababa during the same period. And you can see, therefore, it's not possible, like for the cross-country championships in Mombasa, to prepare in those conditions, Addis Ababa, and go and, and actually compete in the conditions of Mombasa, Osaka, Beijing, Tokyo. And actually, there are bigger problems. Those of you who know the African reality. Um, during the same week period, and this is a video I took when I was staying at the um, Olympic Hotel with a, where the Ethiopian team was preparing for Osaka. And this is a video I took. Watch what is going on outside. Imagine trying to train in those conditions. And it's not that it starts raining for a few moments. It begins and it just carries on raining and raining and raining and raining. Um, and those of you who have been in Ethiopia or Kenya will know that typically Ethiopians and Kenyans don't like the rain. They tend to stay inside if it's raining. So they're not like Europeans who will say, raining a bit, I'll go outside. And in addition to that, this is actually um, from one of the houses of the athletes where we actually set up, as you'll see shortly, our environmental room to simulate the conditions of Osaka. This is also what happens. So you could actually get hurt if you would be training outside in Addis Ababa during the rainy season. Look what happens. I hope you can see these very big hailstones landing uh, on the balcony. So clearly, one cannot train under those conditions. So what you actually need is, if you are going to uh, acclimate, uh, this is the kind of situation you need. You need a, a, a hot a heat room. And this is the heat room I showed you before, the one that I had access to at the time, which was in uh, the University of Glasgow in Scotland, where we could create the environment we want. But we didn't have this in Addis Ababa. So what did we do? Well, in one of the athletes' home, who was a, a very famous athlete, I won't mention the name though, who was very, very kindly offered their house and this particular room to all the athletes wishing to use it, we actually converted the single room here into a hot room. Here you see my, my team at the time, both now professors, Chris Easton and Professor um, Barry Fudge, uh, we'll come back to Barry Fudge's work later on. He became the physiologist of Mofara after he had finished his PhD and head of British athletics. You can see him here um, uh, uh, fixing up the room in, in preparation. Um, you can see all you need here is some heaters, 
um, a big uh, urn here, which is where you boil the water to create the humidity. Anyone here, an engineer or health and safety would look at this and say, oh my God, this is a disaster ready to happen. Keeping in mind, in uh, those of you who go to Africa will know there's constant um, uh, electrical failures. And, and so we eventually needed to get a, a, a backup generator from a truck using diesel, blah, blah, blah. It was a very difficult scenario, but we managed to get the room built. We brought in a treadmill, as you can see here. And at the same time, we need to convince the athletes as to why this was important. Although already Kenanisa was convinced because you saw what happened to him Mombasa, but to make it interesting for them, we would also every day say to them what the conditions were. And you can see this is actually a picture I took uh, of the conditions from uh, the printout of the day. This was actually in August the 18th, 2007. Those of you who may remember the championship started on the 24th of August, 2007. Uh, so this is a basically uh, a week before uh, the soccer world championships. My athletes of interest are still in Addis Ababa a week before. And every day you can see this is actually now the 18th, the 19th, the 20th uh, and so on. This is up to three days before Kenanisa's race. We're writing down the days, He's seeing the conditions. You can see here on Saturday, the conditions in Osaka were 38 degrees uh, to 28 degrees. And you can see the other information as well, visibility, the wind and so on. Um, and then on the door of the environmental chamber, we would actually write, welcome to Osaka, but they weren't going to Osaka. Clearly they were going into a hot room. Um, and you can see the conditions here as well. Um, and here you see now Osaka, in this room, there's Kenanisa doing his training session, acclimatizing to the, those conditions, nice music in the background. It's very, very warm. And importantly, and I'll come back to this, note the, the, the altitude, 2,400 meters. He's achieving both the benefit of having the acclimation that he needs, acclimatization, the acclimation he needs, sorry, and also benefiting from being at altitude and also not having to be under the spotlight in a, in a games environment with the media, their distractions. He can be at home with his family and all of these important aspects. So going using back the analogy of being at a, at a fine dining restaurant, he's having both the seafood here and the meat dishes as well. Uh, and you can see a young Barry Fudge there. Jumping back into the pamphlet, it talks about you need to have also pre-cooling and also per-cooling methods as well that you're going to use to, pre to, to prepare in the warm-up, how to keep yourself cool, not doing what the Ethiopian team did in Mombasa, which is just get some ice and rub it onto your body. That will last for a few seconds and being of no use. Again, I direct you to this pamphlet that you must read in your own time. But you can see what we were doing now. This is back in 2007. You can see Kenisa Bekili here in the hot room with the ice jacket, with an ice collar. And, uh, and this was 2007. There are many new technologies becoming more available. Currently, we have an editorial uh, and a paper under consideration in the, in the British Medical Journal open with new technologies that are, that are becoming available. Uh, for example, you can see the top here, pocket air conditioners. And here is one. This, and actually, you can actually apply it on the back of your, your T-shirt, walk around with it. We don't know if it actually will help in competition if it didn't should be allowed there's a different topic whether it should be allowed but actually wearing this around when you're walking around keeping yourself cool it's a portable air conditioning unit we'll talk about as part of this uh, presentation about the impact of technology and we'll come back to i'm not trying to by the way sell the stuff or anything like that i'm just trying to tell you how it's important to engage in technology technology is available hopefully to everybody that can be used keep competition fair we'll come back to that aspect later Going, jumping back into the, um, into the pamphlet. So when to acclimatize? And you can see here, if you read the pamphlet, there are different uh, options. Uh, option one, which is the one we, uh, and I'll, I'll home in so you can see it better. We chose option one, which is to acclimatize, uh, to acclimate uh, just before going to the competition. Actually, as you saw, three days before uh, the competition, uh, uh, flying to the competition, uh, and while remaining there, also um, arrive there um, acclimatized. You could choose option two, which is acclimatize 
in, uh, those are the weeks at the bottom here. You can acclimatize seven to eight weeks before. Do one or two, it says one session here. I'd prefer to you to do two sessions a week to maintain. That's the beauty of this. You can maintain the benefit. Fly to your competition and, and arrive acclimatized. Or you can go with this option here is to actually um, uh, do some uh, uh, climatization here in the two to three weeks beforehand, fly there and also um, uh, climatize and be acclimatized at the games. Or you can try this version here, which is to arrive three weeks before competition um, and stay there and be acclimatized. I didn't choose this option four for Osaka or indeed Beijing because I wanted to benefit from the altitude. And I'll come back to that. I wanted the meat dish and the seafood dish. So we chose option one. And you can see how, again, it's up to you to choose the option that best suits you. But choosing option one also meant considering other aspects that I'm not gonna talk at all about jet lag, but I, because I know that you've had a webinar on jet lag, but we need to consider the impact of jet lag. And that's also why we chose three days because if you're going from Addis Ababa to Osaka uh, and you're within three time zones, then the best thing to do is not to change time zone. So not to change your time, your, your, your virtual clock, okay? Or your, uh, your biological clock is stick to the time zone that, or the conditions that you, that you were in before you started. And so we benefited from knowing that he would get the benefit of the altitude benefit of the acclimatization or the acclimation he was doing. And he would arrive there not having to, to worry that performance is reduced because of jet lag if he was going to be there for, the, for one week waiting for competition. So again, you can see how it's important that we integrate all these different components, um, also the jet lag. And that's why we chose option one. It brings me to, because I know you've had a session uh, on altitude. And for me, altitude is vitally important. You won't get your 15, 16% potentially um, that you can get from the, from the acclimation, but altitude is vitally important. And here you can see a review published by Barry Fudge while he was the head of British athletics together with some uh, colleagues here from the University of Brighton as well. We, he, co he contrasts the different train high uh, live high, train low paradigms, but he also talks because he had he had witnessed for himself being a PhD student in Ethiopia, how the, the Ethiopian athletes were doing something quite different. And that's what I'm going to share with you today. They lived high and they trained higher, doing something very different to your traditional live high, train low, which is what our European athletes tend to do. Um, and again, you can read this in your own time. I know you've had a session of altitudes. So I'll go through this quite quickly, but there's a problem. 2016, a world expert on altitude publishes this very important paper, Carsten Lundby, does altitude training increase exercise performance in elite athletes? And what he says here is that he's not convinced that elite athletes benefit from altitude training. And I found this quite um, uh, alarming, but this is what the coaches, the physiologists, the sports doctors were hearing and listening to saying, maybe it doesn't work, but could it be it doesn't work because of the choice of the program? Um, and so to develop this a little bit further, I'd like to spend a little time on altitude. And in particular, raising the question, does altitude training increase excess performance in elite athletes? Yes or no? Uh, and that's a key, key question of paramount importance because all of these different things are important. And I'm going through this very quick because I know you've had the session on, on this. The traditional live high, train low uh, by the, the scientist Stray Goodison and his team. And they're talking about how um, elite runners, uh, sea level 3000 meter running performance improved significantly after 27 day camp utilizing the, the live high, train low paradigm. How does it work? The suggestion was that a stimulation of uh, erythropoiesis, so increasing red blood cells, increase oxygen delivery to the tissues by doubling of plasma EPO. So it's a natural EPO doping and, and therefore increasing hemoglobin and, um, uh, and your red blood cells on return to sea levels. That's the idea. And again, from my experience at the time as well, um, uh, the athletes, the Ethiopian team, you can see here, uh, training in preparation for World 
Championships in preparation for the Olympic Games, you can see again having to run a little bit in the in the rain because you'll never get a chance to rain to run if you if you're too afraid of the wet conditions. But notice they're training outside Addis Ababa, 2,800 meters. Uh, um, so they're getting the benefit here of altitude um, uh, all the time. They're living there, and actually they're situated here at 2,800 meters where they're training, but they, most of these athletes live at 2,400 meters, which is in Addis Ababa in the city. Um, going back to Live High, Train Low by Stray Goodison, you'll recall potentially that the athletes were in Indiana, did some pre-testing at the at the, uh, the national uh, uh, competition, went to um, a seven day camp at 2,500 meters, so not as high as the Ethiopians, did their sprint work or speed training at uh, an interval training low at Salt Lake City, and then came back and competed in Indiana. Um, I'm not gonna dwell on this too much, but basically the parameters change, the, the hemoglobin, hematocrit, erythropoiet, I just wanna show you an example that um, hemoglobin, let's take hematocrit, which is easier to understand. It goes from 41 here at sea level. After being um, at, at, at the altitude for 27 days, you can see going up to 43. So going up significant amount. And this was the justification as to why they saw performance benefits. What happened to performance? We saw that um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the men, uh, performance was improved from 818 to 812. And in, the, uh, and in the girls uh, from 9.32 to 9.26. So it clearly worked. What happened to the big physiological parameter that we all know, which is VO2 max, it goes from 76 to 77 uh, in the men and 64 to 66 or so in the women. So you can see how it, how it was suggested it works. But then again, we get these papers saying it doesn't work. So can we get an idea from the best athletes in the world what they're doing? Um, and as we already know, the best Kenyan athletes or the best, uh, some of the best athletes in the world are from the small region in Kenya, uh, an area called the Nandi region, which is part of the, uh, the, the, the Rift Valley province. Um, and, and you can see this data we published back in 2006, one of my PhD students who now is a, is a professor at Kenyatta University. Here on the X axis, you have the, the Kenyan national data on the left, control data on the left here, and then we have the living legends on I here. And you can see most of the top athletes, as you can see in black, are from the Rift Valley province. So why is it that the Kenyan national team produce athletes from high, uh, from high altitude if high altitude is not important? And some years ago, nine, we published this book on trying to explain what makes these East Africans great. And I'm not gonna go through all these because I don't have time and it's not relevant really. We can ignore superior genetics. We're not gonna talk about the other things, but we'll talk a bit about the high altitude training. They train and live at high altitude and not just live at, uh, and train at high altitude for long periods of time, but they live high and they train even higher. Where do I get this information, both in Kenya and Ethiopia? In Kenya, I get a lot of this information I'm sharing with you from uh, a professor of sports science now, Mike Boyd, who was also a great uh, Olympian himself. You can see him running here um, back in uh, uh, being a medalist uh, in the 72 Olympics. And also even today he holds the downhill one mile world record um, uh, in 328 that he broke in 1983. But also my information I'm sharing with you is from um, uh, Rhodesia, the very the, the world record holder uh, uh, for the 800 meters. Uh, and, and, and his coach amongst, uh, he has produced a great number of great athletes uh, brother Colum, uh, you can see him um, talking to his pupils at his school. This is where I'm getting my information from. And you can see the focus on high altitude training camps, interval training, very hard training, doing bone breaking sessions, but doing this at altitude. And here's an example of the athletes in Kenya doing these sessions. I'm not gonna, I don't have time to go to break them down, but this, this is old GPS back in 2006, 2007, warm up followed by three 1,000 meters and three 600 meters, three 400 meters, three 200 meters. You can see the time here drafted uh, with a pen here. Pretty, pretty hard sessions. And this is happening at altitude. Hence the reason bone breaking sessions. 
And you can see the back of the t-shirt of these athletes here training at Chip Colel, blood, sweat, and tears, uh, which really summarize the hard work they do, but they're doing this at altitude. Um, uh, at the same time, we published uh, a series of scientific papers uh, that involved some of these athletes that were going to the, the world championships. And I'm just showing this paper from one of our students then and Barry, uh, this table here, table four, which shows you using accelerometry, these little gadgets you can place on the athlete, how much activity they're doing every day. And I just wanna put this up to show you that most of the time, most, the least amount of time is spent in heavy training. Most of the time they are doing light and moderate training. So training extremely hard, bone breaking, but most of the time is recovering. And this is to show you the importance of recovery. Uh, not only training very, very hard at altitude, which is what they're doing, but also recovery, which is vitally important. Uh, and that's why I want to stress that. And also here, I've already mentioned the importance of the African diet. And uh, this was very important. This came out of the analysis we did. And just to show you that all these athletes that were going to the games, um, if you look at um, the column on the right, and if you had the looking at the sports nutrition, you need sports nutrition input, the recommendations for middle and long distance running or endurance sport is to have anywhere above six to eight grams per kilogram carbohydrate. You can see here, every single athlete easily attained that. And this, they had no sports nutrition uh, advice. This was the African rural diet. So again, no need to change something if it's working. And subsequently, just so you know, we've replicated this in Ethiopia Again, the Ethiopian team going to uh, the world championships were doing the same thing. Very high carbohydrate all the time. It's the Ethiopian diet. Let's jump back into the, to the, um, uh, to the pamphlet. I'm looking at the time here. I'm, I'm certainly running much behind schedule. So I'm gonna have to jump eventually some bits, but- um, No problem, I'll take your time, Yanis. Thank you, Pedro, because I'm getting a bit anxious about the time. Um, no, no, don't, don't be. Okay. Good, good. So I will, but you stop me if I'm going too long. Anyway, so so jumping back into the into the pamphlet, um, uh, how does hydration impact performance? And you can see again, if you look at the pamphlet, it talks about uh, dehydration impact on performance that could range between two and eight percent, which is obviously a serious uh, amount of decrement in performance. But there's an issue we need to consider: one size does not fit all. And here you see from the Athens Olympics, three of the athletes that I've had the pleasure over the years to study and, and, uh, and work with. Um, and I don't want to disclose their personal data, wouldn't be appropriate. But this, but so if I've just used the range here, these three athletes, uh, Haile Gabriel Selassie, Kenisa Bikili, and Shalesha Shaheen, are arguably three of the best uh, 10K athletes, track athletes ever. The maximum sweat range, a sweat rate measured in the laboratory ranged between 0.8 to 3.6 liters an hour. You can see how different that is. I can't tell you who was 0.8 and I can't tell you 3.6, but some of you may know the answer to that, but I won't tell you now. Um, but the point is, how do you prepare? How, why should you give the same program to all these three athletes? They are very, very different. And that's why I'll talk a bit about, if I have time and Pedro allows me to, to go over time, I'll speak a bit about the technology because we need to individualize the preparation. Hence the reason for future, future uh, technological input to try and individualize the response. Back in 2007, we tried ourselves to try and do the individualized response. And here you can see Haile Gabriel Selassie going to Berlin. And uh, what we had done beforehand is that we had used, using the bottle you see here, we had, we had noted that each time the bottle touched his lips, how much he would actually consume. And then we digitized these video clips uh, every time the bottle went to his mouth. And we could calculate also where we could or could not collect the bottles, how much he would drink during competition, because what you do in training is not necessarily what they do in competition. You want to try and make those two match up. And we did that for a number of athletes, top athletes. We published the work some years ago, and you can see a lot of marathons down here, including the Athens Olympics here. 
And this is the volume in liters per hour. And you can see how different in, in gray bars, this is what we measured using the digitization of, of the film. Um, and in white bars are what we extrapolated because sometimes an athlete was behind another one and we couldn't see from the film. Um, and you can see somewhere within the recommendations, which is the gray box. Others here, you can see what happened in Rotterdam, New York. Um, uh, look at Beijing, Beijing Olympics. Um, you know, the winner here, okay, um, who still has the Olympic record for the marathon, the late one, Giro, is not drinking anywhere near the recommendations at the time. Um, so you can see again the importance of getting data related to your athlete. Um, I said to you, I wasn't going to tell you who was at 3.6 uh, kilograms an hour, but you can see here, it's the athlete here, athlete number three. And so you can guess who that is, who at the end of this race here had lost 10% of their body mass, uh, but was still running faster for the second half. What I'm trying to tell you is that these general remarks of dehydration of 8% reduction in performance by so much, et cetera, et cetera, we have to observe the impact in our athletes. We actually use the fact that this athlete would lose 10% of his body weight to help him run faster the second half. And you can see here, I won't read this out for you, but a reduction of 9.8% allowed this athlete to carry less weight in the second half, to run equal, even faster the second half. And this was not de detrimental to him but to another sport, this could be detrimental. To another athlete, this could be detrimental in the same competition. And so we use this information. We broke the world record in 2007 here um, in Berlin, as you can see. At this point, I was meant to get to half time. So you can see how badly I'm out of time. But anyway, we'll continue. Um, so jumping back into the pamphlet. So what should the athlete drink? And again, I'll let you uh, read the pamphlet, but here shown here in the pamphlet is the hydration index of a lot of different um, uh, beverages that people tend to drink during the, the course of their uh, life habits. And it's very interesting to compare, and this is a comparison with, uh, with, um, uh, with still water. And you can see that skimmed milk, full fat uh, milk comes right to the top 1.5, compared to coffee here, which is actually, you can see here, is not a very good, doesn't have as a very low hydration index. So clearly you want to be closer to the top. This is kind of just uh, hydration related um, uh, uh, items that one can have. But it's quite interesting that skim milk and full milk came to the top. Let me jump out of the pamphlet. Back to one of our training camps, the global training camp then in, um, uh, in Kenya. You may recognize here the great Eliud Kipchoge here, sitting here, drinking his tea. Um, this is a Gatorade bottle, but it's not Gatorade. They are drinking tea, milky tea. They had no nutritional advice. This is tradition. In Kenya, if you visit Kenya, you're given milky tea. The milky tea comes from the cow that's in the, in the yard, uh, reboiled twice to pasteurize it. And you can see the athletes as well after, this is actually a photograph of these athletes after a very hard bone breaking session. And this is actually Elif Kipchoge here washing his own shoes after a hard training session. And you know, you may consider from a physiotherapist point of view, and there may be some physiotherapists listen to us, the benefit of doing this kind of stretching exercise as he's doing post a hard training session. But what did the data point, uh, what, what can we learn from the data? This is Vincent's publication a few years back with Mike Boyd as well. Look at the water intake, just over a liter a day, but watch the tea intake, having over one liter. I'm not telling you this to run and have tea. I'm just trying to show you that it's important that we assess what our athletes are doing. You can also see this is a quotation from the paper. Athletes did not consume water before during training and infrequently consume modest amounts of water after training. So again, we need to test everything in our own athletes, what is good for them, and we, can, and we need to actually collect data, have an integrated response in what we do. Some, some months later, Barry Fudge, together with the team, we replicated this data because this data sounds almost unbelievable to some of you. And you can see here, if you read this paper published a few months after that one by Barry Fudge and us and the group, 
we found exactly the same, that these athletes, by drinking ad libitum, which means drinking to thirst, they were maintaining their hydration status, so it was not impacting them negatively. So we were, in this case, measuring their hydration status. Let's go into the field again to show you how we do our measurements in the field. Here's our sub two vehicle following our athletes, providing our athletes the uh, drinking because some of them weren't maintaining their hydration, especially not during competition, during, sorry, during training. And you can see one of our sports nutritionists here providing um, um, uh, fluid. You need to keep on top and I'm not gonna spend time on new uh, exciting innovations in sports nutrition. I've already said my conflict of interest and we've developed this very exciting innovation that some of you are aware of, um, a encapsulated carbohydrate uh, drink, uh, which you can read about in your own time. But the important point here is that we were providing during a very hard session at altitudes, altitude in the heat, 30% carbohydrate, 30%, yes, ladies and gentlemen, with no GI disturbance having a small amount, that 4% body mass loss, able to train really hard, no problems at all. That mix has been used with success a lot of marathons. Again, I'm not selling you this, I'm trying to tell you to do this. What I'm trying to say is be open-minded with new technologies, new ideas that exist, test them in training before you do anything in competition. The beauty of, of, of doing my work both in Ethiopia and Kenya lets us to validate and replicate findings in one country to the other. I'm gonna spend a few moments uh, just finishing off uh, the altitude component uh, with what um, the Ethiopians do, because I stressed a lot there, the Kenyans and the coach uh, of Kenisa Bekile for um, leading up to Osaka was Tolosa Kotu. He used Tolosa Kotu he himself was a great athlete competing here in the Olympic games with the famous Lasse Viren and uh, Miros Yifta. And also his then coach and now coach, uh, which is uh, Mersha Azrat. Again, similar to what we saw in Kenya, where are the athletes from in Ethiopia? They're not from anywhere. They're from these dark areas of Arsi and Shiwa. And you can see how many athletes per million. These are altitude regions. And again, if we measured the control population in Ethiopia in the big circle here, and we compare to the marathon runners, you can see these two regions, Arsi and Shiwa, produce more than 70% of the Ethiopian runners. Why? Because of altitude. There's one tray, there's one stadium, one track, one Mondo track, at least in 2007 in Ethiopia. Here you can see the athlete doing their hard work, their bone breaking sessions to use the Kenyan term at 2,400 meters. Again, here's one of the training sessions we did only a, a couple of weeks before going to the world championships. This is a session that we monitored on with Kenanisa at 16 bouts of 200 and 400 meters. Uh, I won't go through it through to detail, but you can see very similar to what we saw in Kenya. Again, hard, hard training being done at altitude. A lot of time, most of the time they are sleeping and recovering. Here we see them again, um, um, uh, Mersha uh, uh, working with some of the athletes in the stadium and in particular trying out this in this particular experiment or training session, we were trying out the 30% carbohydrate mix to individualize it to the athlete. Again, the importance is not that you go and buy this drink or anything like that. I don't, I don't make any money from this drink, to be very, very clear, but it's to tell you to engage with personalized nutrition as long as we can do it. Here we see um, uh, Kenisa Bikile trying out the drink, personalizing it during training out in, at, at altitude using it in competition with success. Those of you saw the 2016 Berlin Marathon, which he won uh, in, a, uh, in a remarkable time. Um, um, uh, and also you can see here, we'll come back if we have time uh, on the shoes. He had two, he had two uh, big innovations on the day, a very special drink, very special shoe. So his main competitor, which is Wilson Kipsang in the background, really had no choice. The best, the best athlete potentially of all time had the best preparation of all time. No one could have beaten him on that day. And hence the success we got. Coming back to the notion of altitude, live high, train higher, which is what these athletes tend to do. Here we have time on this axis, speed on this Y axis, as well as altitude. And this is where Kenanisa is going to do his altitude training. Watch the altitude up to 3,160 meters. He's living high, training higher. 
So when we have a lot of high algae doesn't work, well, are you doing this? Are you prepared for this? You can see why we sometimes get to the wrong conclusions. Here you see us following Kenanisa in one of his training sessions, that session I showed you at 3,160 meters. Look at the terrain, by the way. We follow him close by because we're taking measurements from him, but also as jokingly, he wanted us to do that because he was afraid of being attacked by any hyenas. Uh, but look at the terrain he's running. Excellent preparation as well. Physiotherapists who are listening to us here will say this is exactly the kind of thing you want not to have repetitive strain disorders, okay, or issues. Excellent environment to do this high altitude training. At the same point, I must say that on another occasion, we'd go to the same area, 3,160 meters, and do interval training running uphills at 3,160 meters. So again, hard, hard training at high altitude. So we heard what the scientific expert before wrote, high altitude doesn't work, shouldn't be recommended for elite athletes. I, don't, I, want, I didn't attend your session on high altitude that, that Pedro arranged for you. Let's listen to an expert, a real expert here, Haile. What does he say? A very, a very important uh, place for training. Uh, this mountain for me, it's a, uh, you know, three thousand two hundred meters above sea level. Yeah, that's the church. If you're training there, the church. did you check? You know how how difficult. Uh, it is a big big problem to get you know, just enough oxygen in that uh, mountain. You see, that's you know, our secret. That's one of our advantage. We're training there. We go down for competition. We go for a sea level, like Berlin. You can achieve very easily. Uh, I've been training you know, that mountain the last 21 years since I came to Addis Ababa. And uh, in total, it's a magic place. Really. But again, we heard from the experts earlier or the study by um, uh, the, the Live High Train Low study that it's important to be able to do speed work. Well, again, the Ethiopians have figured this out because less than 100 kilometers away from Addis Ababa is a town of Nazareth, which is located 1500 meters. This is where they do their speed work. And you can see the session here that Kenanisa did. And also they go to Nazareth because it's lower altitude, it tends to be much hotter. And that is also where Kenanisa and the Ethiopian team were doing their uh, acclimatization. So the acclimatization, which is in the non-hot room, doing it in the real environment, this is where they were doing it, in the place of Nazareth. So they were living high, training higher, and doing some quality runs and acclimatization um, at lower altitude. This knowledge, that some have disputed uh, was then adopted by British athletics. And you can see why the Ethiopians and Kenyans got quite upset when Barry Fudge implemented a lot of this technology with MOFARA, with the Nike Oregon project at the time. And you'll have witnessed the success of MOFARA. A great athlete who's chosen his parents well, not because he's African, chose his parents well, prepared very well, using the best, the state of the art of what's available the results are clear. Kenyans are very unhappy. They want to ban, they want to ban Mo Farah from training in Kenya. You can see what the Minister of Sport is saying. Um, why should we allow him to train here? And then he beats us. Um, and you can see, well, we all need to learn. This knowledge is in the public domain. We need to prepare for the conditions. Since then, Mo Farah tends to spend more time now in Sululta uh, at this, and, and more recently, uh, Kenanisa has built a track that you can see here located 2,800 meters and that's the track here uh, that MOFAR and other athletes maybe some of your Portuguese athletes go there I'm not I'm not sure doing their training both in the forest but also on the track so this issue about alter training does it increase performance in elite athletes clearly yes but you need to know what you're doing and remember not one size fits everyone Quickly on nutrition, because it's vitally important, and Pedro, this must get it across because it's very, very important. The issue of uh, nutritional support, I've already mentioned what the Africans did in terms of carbohydrate. This IOC consensus statement written some years ago, which is still relevant today, 
that the amount, composition, and timing of food intake can profoundly affect sports performance. Good nutritional practice will help athletes train hard, recover quickly, and adapt more effectively with less risk of illness and injury. I hope all the physicians, all the sports scientists uh, uh, who are supporting athletes have read the IOC consensus on supplements. Please have read this. Of the thousands of supplements, only five work. I'm not gonna tell you which five work because I want you to read this because it's very, very important. Importantly, however, you need to do a risk benefit assessment because this paper that's referred to in the consensus talks about the dangers of supplementation in terms of contamination uh, with a very, very small amount of 0.000005%, so tiny amount, which is almost not measurable by these companies or, or not measured at all by these companies who are selling these supplements, you can be at risk of having an, an adverse analytical finding. So be very, very careful about supplements um, and only take supplements if you're deficient, if they really work and therefore do a proper risk assessment. Pedro, this is very important. I think you may want to have a session just on supplements for the athletes going to the games. It's very, very important. And to do a risk assessment, I'm not gonna go through this because of time, but it tells you in this paper how to do that risk assessment. Um, and there's a flow chart of how to uh, prevent, uh, hopefully a violation, adverse analytical finding violation. Again, I'm not gonna go over this because I want your support teams to be doing this. But what's really important, the why I wanted to stress this um, is that again, I have the, uh, the real honor to be part of the IOC Medical Mission, which entitles me at the games to be part of the games group. So every day we get to listen to all the issues that, we are, that our athletes are facing. Here's a photograph from the PyeongChang Winter Olympics of 2018. And um, uh, I'm not sharing any private data, so I'm allowed to show you this. Here was the supplement use declaration of the athletes at the Winter Olympic Games of that day. 63% were declaring supplement use. I do not believe 63% were deficient, but they were taking it in case they needed it. Not a good idea to do that. Please be careful. We need, maybe we need proper regulation, we certainly need better education, and we need to an antidote, antidote for fake news. Um, I'm a bit concerned of time. Um, uh, Pedro, um, what should I do? Um, I, I, I don't know, because I, I know you, you, could, you could be here talking the whole day. I, I, I'm, I'm I jump completely... to technology, maybe, um, and go straight but to the last Maybe that's I don't the best. know exactly what, how, many, how many chapters. Okay. Okay, what, I'll, what I'll do is uh, I will go through this very quickly so I have an idea, and then we can talk about maybe in questions. Okay, so I'll give me another um, five minutes, okay? And then we can end. Five, ten, if you need. Five, ten. Okay, let's make it into, uh, ten, okay. uh, ten more minutes, and then I'll stop. And okay. I, I forgive me, everyone. I, I, uh, I was too optimistic that I could get through all of this. So as I mentioned to you, um, and I've already alluded to the importance of being able to utilize technology moving forward, hence to become a technophile. Um, and I just want to pay, pay some attention to this particular race in the Rio Olympics, uh, the, the winner of the gold medal, uh, Samgog, in particular, she's wearing a shoe, which now we know is the carbon fiber plate shoe and, and, and the fact that it can benefit some athletes as, many, as much as 8%, but some elite athletes may benefit them almost nothing. So again, important why we need to now engage with this technology because now it's allowed um, uh, and to ensure that our shoe uh, or other technology that we have, that we are allowed to use, we can get maximum benefit from. You can see all, all medalists were wearing those shoes. Think about it if you were one of those athletes at those games, not wearing a carbon fiber plate. Um, at the same time, this particular athlete, some of you may be aware, was subsequently found doping with EPO so she may have an eight to 10% benefit overall from the shoe and from the drug. You can see the issue and a big concern of mine. Hence, we published a lot of papers in terms of, of using the, the break, the postponement of the Olympic games due to COVID as a means to deal with these integrity, units, these integrity issues. And also to try and understand the technology, not to be a slave of the technology and not make technology be the determining factor of the, of the result 
but making it so that all athletes have a greater chance to fulfill their potential and be best prepared for the conditions, but everyone should have equal access. I jump back into the pamphlet. It talks about how much to drink. Um, and they talk about using the color of your urine. Again, it's a very nice, easy way to do it. Jumping back to 2000 and, uh, in the early 2000s and, and late 2000s, when we were testing out some of this technology, you can see a young Elliot Kipchoge doing his hard training sessions with a patch uh, or patches on uh, different parts of his body. Uh, we have one of our members of our group here, David Kingsmore, taking off the patch later in the lab analyzing. Unfortunately, it took us three months to get that result from that patch. That was back in, in, in the early 2000s, how difficult it was to do it then. At the time, this is actually in the, the camp. Uh, this is Chris Cesar and Fessus Kiplamai doing the analysis of the urine uh, using osmometer. Okay, that's portable. We have a machine here at the time. This is back in, in the early 2000s, uh, testing the hydration of the athletes. But the point was some of these measurements, like the sweat composition, we would only analyze, we went back to Glasgow months later. Since then, however, things have moved on. Technology now is available. We can measure the temperature of the, of the athlete using a thermopull. Um, that's vitally important. This is available. We've since used that technology in competitions like the New York Marathon with uh, Girmay Gibrasalasi. Here he, he's with a device uh, measuring his core temperature. Here at this point um, uh, into the race, he attacks. You can see him attacking. Um, and this information is vital to the coach. I don't have time to show you an athlete who was dropped at this point, and you can see the temperature parameters are very, very different. Lessons from Doha, we already know the kind of responses because in, in 2016, Sebastian was able to, to use these thermopoles in competition. You can see the road racing response versus the time trial. The shorter distances are the ones where we need to worry more because the temperature, the body temperature is higher. So don't feel your event is long, so you don't have to worry, so an issue. Also from Doha, you can see that um, it wasn't the longer events where the temperatures reached very high, although they did as well. This, this highest response was an athlete running the 10Ks, reaching a temperature of over 40.5. Problem though, this, this kind of technology, you need to download it after the competition. What we are developing now, and this will be hopefully available for athletes to use very soon in the lead up to the games. This is a project that's also funded um, uh, by the International Olympic Committee to make this kind of technology available in training so that the coach can monitor the athlete during preparation and also potentially in competition. I don't have time to go through this. Maybe, uh, Pedro, we can have a session one time only on technology. Not only measuring temperature, but now with our various partners, we can measure all sorts of different things. I don't have time to go through this little video, but this little video here, which I won't show you, measures sweat electrolytes. So you can measure the sodium uh, of the sweat in real time, not having to wait for three months down the line. Um, so the laboratory, here's our laboratory, our subject laboratory in Ethiopia, and you can see Kenanisa testing the shoe and us measuring his bioenergetics. We can move the laboratory now into the field. And you can see our Kenyan athletes now using this technology, using the, 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 the cloud to get this information in real time. Now with the pandemic, the coach can't travel to, comp to training. The coach can watch the responses, monitor the sweat composition remotely. This is what we need to be doing moving forward. It'll help us individualize the training response. Which training program is better? How many weeks do I need? Some athletes may need three weeks. Some athletes may need three months. This kind of data will allow us to make those decisions because technology that we've had up until now, total hemoglobin mass, that's what a lot of us have used in the past, is not that sensitive um, as other technology that we can apply in the future. To individualize training, to personalize training, that is what we need to do. And this is the kind of technology that will help us to look at all these different parameters. This is an Olympic athlete where all these uh, lines are inserted into the athlete when they're doing a maximum test. None of your athletes will agree to do this in competition, but this technology will allow us to get this information in real time so the coach can make informed decisions of how to prepare their athlete. Getting this kind of information in competition is also vital. 
And this approach, by the way, in my introduction, we heard there that uh, my main focus at the moment is on anti-doping approaches. This is the technology we're using to, revolution, to revolutionize anti-doping to catch the cheaters using the same technology. And I'm not gonna go through this because of time, so I'll go to the last section now. I'll bypass all this because to the belief bit and I'll finish in the next minute. Um, and I hope I, although I jumped over very quickly, the importance of the technology to allow us to help our athletes, but also protect the integrity of the sport by making it fair in terms of technological doping and traditional forms of doping. And maybe another session in the future on that. So belief. I'm not going to show you the first uh, sub minute, four minute mile because of time, but you've all witnessed that and you're all aware of that as over 50 years ago, uh, but by Sir Roger Pattinson. And you may recall what happened uh, in, in uh, 1954, Sir Roger Bannister on the 6th of May broke four minute miles. Only a few weeks, a few days later, 21st of June, John Rand Landy did the same. And then when they competed against each other, um, Sir Roger Bannister won that race. My point of showing you this is that if your team believes and convinces the athlete and the athlete believes in the team that they prepared perfectly, then the result will be the desired result. And to quote um, uh, Bannister, uh, which I'll show shortly, but Bannister, as it says here, Bannister achieved what he believed his coach believed could be achieved. The support team, all of you who are listening to this, by your actions, you contribute to the perception each athlete has of her or his ultimate performance. And this is the quote. This is what Sir Roger Bannister said. The crucial thing is he was referring to his coach, well I, if you, uh, well, I think you can run 356. If he believed that, I hope he did, it certainly was a helpful comment. He said, if you have the chance and you don't take it, you may regret for the rest of your time. That is why, ladies and gentlemen, we need to take on all of these approaches, apply them all, believe as well. And if we do, and our athlete believes in us, you can achieve everything. Belief is vital. So what was the outcome in Osaka? All the athletes that took part in the project, especially uh, Kenanisa and Seleshi, achieved the, the, the results that they wanted. Kenisa won double gold in Osaka, as you may recall. In Beijing, double gold. We're not saying that he did that because of the support. The support allowed him to fulfill his potential on the day. And that is what the aim of today's uh, webinar is all about. And I must acknowledge the going for gold team. I thank them, including the athletes who who without their uh, allowance for us to join them in training and to, to be around them all the time, uh, we would not have this information to share with you in the world of sports medicine to protect the health and the performance of all athletes. Direct you to Athlete 365. Please download the, the pamphlet. Forgive me for go rushing the second half of the talk. I look forward to answering any questions there may be uh, due to time. Um, I'm happy to stay for as long as you want me to, and uh, I thank you for your attention, and I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you so, so much, uh, Yanis. It was uh, an outstanding uh, presentation. We have a very, very, very positive feedback about this and uh, all the people. Please, please let him talk. Let him talk because this is very, very interesting. Uh, it's, uh, it, was, it was really amazing and somebody with your experience and your knowledge combined because it's not about only talking about uh, only the, the, the knowledge by itself or not only about the, the experience. As we see, you have it combined. You have already tried a lot of things in training. You have, uh, you have for sure failed sometimes to get into big, big, big and huge achievements like you. Like you. And it, it was so uh, important for us to, to uh, like to drink uh, like we used to say in Portugal from your, from your uh, knowledge and, and experience because these, this kind of experience, you don't have it on books. You have to, you have to, to pass through things. So it, it, was, it was really amazing. Um, before getting in, into questions, I would, uh, I would like to, to say something to, to our participants. Um, I know uh, some of the participants couldn't enter. I don't know exactly why, because of the uh, Zoom, I don't know. We had 
almost 140 people uh, on on the on the presentation but i know many more wanted to enter i don't know what happened um, I, I will try to contact everybody and say that next monday probably next monday we will have these uh, this session completely uh, prepared for you in our website so you can review this session the times you want and uh, please pass the message to every every single person that can be interested on these uh, that in during next week you you can you can uh, access this information uh, about the beat the heat document uh, it's uh, an uh, outstanding document also. We based on that to make a, a document for all the Portuguese participants. We have it in our website and I will, uh, I will uh, um, at this moment, I try, to, uh, I try to put here a link to everybody but it goes only to Pedro Leitão. I don't know why because he, uh, well, don't I will try. Choose all. So when you're doing the, the chat, choose, click on everyone. You should have everyone, hopefully. Yeah. However, I will try to do it uh, maybe later. It doesn't work right now. However, um, you have it in our, in our website, the document in Portuguese, uh, based on the document of the Athlete 365, a uh, work from our uh, sports uh, medicine direction uh, here in, in the uh, Olympic Committee. Um, and before getting to the, to the, the, the audience uh, questions, I would like to make a question because we have here a problem. Uh, actually, at this moment, uh, we we have a problem about making uh, making decisions uh, about traveling to Tokyo, uh, and we have this uh, this problem because IOC and the the, the Tokyo organizing committee at the moment uh, reduced to five days before the first day of competition of all sports to enter the, at the in the Olympic Village. We had the our plan A was with almost all the athletes to go as early as possible to the, to the, to the Olympic Village to get into acclimatization and eight hours jet lag. And, and um, it was depending on the altitude uh, training also they, they had before, of course, but uh, things were going this way. But now we have other information and we, 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 we as this was a few weeks ago, and, and we are trying to make the best solution possible. And uh, of course, if they cannot live at the Olympic Village, they have to live somewhere else because they have to make the acclimatization and the adaptation to the jet lag. And um, coming down from the altitude, when what do you think about this? Uh, what could your your, uh, what is your uh, opinion about this? You, you, you talked about some possibilities uh, yeah. about uh, acclimatization, but what is your opinion about this? Okay. Again, it depends on the sport. It depends on how much competition they have. Some, some sports, you know, there'll be one competition. Others will have many days of competition. Um, uh, just using my example again, where um, Kenisa, for example, would do the 5K, the 10K first, and then qualification for the 5k and then a 5k final so so they were and for for him it was actually quite good because he went for the very last minute so there was no need for for worrying about the jet lag because he arrived within the three days so there was actually no jet lag he didn't even, he didn't even know what was jet lag so he would arrive go straight into his preparation stick to the time zone that he already had from ethiopia compete successfully which he did and then has a week almost to adapt to the tokyo Sorry, to the Osaka conditions or the Beijing conditions, um, and then it was easy for him because he, so therefore he had he was there for maybe ten days, um, but he had to in that sense because he had two three competitions. Um, now, in your case, an example that you use now for an athlete who um, wants to make, benefit also from being at altitude, because I do believe altitude is so important. Um, uh, you know, they again you need to consider that because if they are going to stay there for for a prolonged period of time, that will be lost. But uh, as some, knowing from, from the, my experience of potentially European athletes, 
they don't particularly stay at altitude before competition. They'll probably go and spend more time in, in Osaka or, or in this case, um, uh, Tokyo. So what I would recommend is don't change your plans that you had planned beforehand. So if the plan before was, and, and what we should have happened, and I don't know how much you've done this, is we used Osaka as preparation for Beijing. So maybe a lot, some of your athletes, now I've already, I know with pandemic, it's been difficult, but either you've actually practiced something you're gonna do for, for Tokyo, or you had a plan. I would ask that the, I ho I'd hope that the Portuguese Olympic Committee can provide the support needed so the program remains the same, but you won't be in the Olympic Village. That is problematic. I understand all the problematic parts of it, but you have to break it down and say, well, okay, because what the point is, if you go, if, you, if you're competing in five days from arrival, it's not ideal because you will be suffering the detriments of jet lag. So I don't think it's advisable as much as you can um, to arrive five days before your competition and hope for the best because you won't be at 100%. Uh, so I think therefore, uh, and I probably made quite a difficult answer is that try and stick to what you know works based on what the scientific uh, evidence supports. And I think your previous session on jet lag that you've done, mine supports it as well. We're saying the same thing is that try and supplement what the IOC can provide for you. It's not ideal. These are not, ex these are exceptional circumstances. And I think the budget is something that you need to consider for this and say, well, okay, it's vital our athletes, because uh, altitude may not be a big issue for you guys. What's more important is the jet lag and the associated issues there that you say, okay, they're gonna transition from one place to the other. And that's, you bite the bullet and you have to go with that. Um, but know that if you don't do that, and that actually I would say is the argument that, that may be done to those who control the, the money uh, in the Portuguese Olympic Committee. And I know it's a difficult time for everyone. It's a, it's, a, it's a financial disaster for everyone. Therefore, that's looking at sponsors and say, okay, what is best for our athletes is this. This is the budget will cost and you try and do that and put that program together, but not turn it other way around. So, okay, we only have five days. Well, how are we gonna fit it in now and do the best science we can? Because you won't be able to do it. I don't know if that answers the question. Yes, thank you. Uh, there is no, there is no one uh, answer for this. Uh, we we must uh, work, and we will still work with, with all the sports because it's a different, different situation from from each sport. So, but thank you anyway. I will go to to some questions uh, um, from our from our um, audience. And uh, I, will, I will give uh, priority to the questions com completely related to the, to, with the team uh, uh, about Tokyo preparation. And, and uh, what I feel is, is more connected with Tokyo preparations. Then we go to the others if we, if we have time uh, for that. So ab about this, because you were, you were talking about uh, uh, worse, preparing for the worst conditions and I, I, I I have here Tomás Domingues, a question from Tomás Domingues. Imagine two similar athletes, one training for the worst conditions and the other training for the best conditions. Which one of the athletes will have the best performance if they face the best conditions in the competition day? Will the athlete that has trained for the worst conditions going to have any advantage? Um, Amazing question, really amazing question. That's why, um, and I really thank the, the, the person who asked the question. That is why this talk was so difficult to do. I put all of these things together to ensure that the athlete who's, who's doing the more difficult route to prepare for the worst conditions is not negatively impacted by doing that. Um, so the direct answer is that the, uh, if, the if the conditions are less severe, as long as our athlete who's prepared for the worst conditions, you have, it hasn't cost them, they don't get any baggage because of that, it will, they will, uh, there will not be a difference. Uh, the best athlete on the day will win and that's what you want. However, you are gambling. You are gambling because if the conditions and I think this, and your weather people may have done this in their seminar, wasn't available. It appears from some of the data coming out from prognosis is that Tokyo this year may be worse, may be pretty bad. I would be, if I was gambling, I'd gamble on the worst side. Um, but if I was gambling on the worst side, 
I would ensure that you use a holistic pr uh, uh, approach to ensure that we don't hurt the athlete. And so that's why that question is such an important one. And it really is the core of this presentation that we are dealing with a very difficult situation, why we need data. That's also the reason why I said for the future, we need to have better ways of identifying the individual response before damage happens. How is the athlete coping? And a lot of it, if we're looking with our eyes, we can't see, Pedro, the problems that are emerging. But we can't, you can see that when you have information so that the damage before it's happening happened because all the coaches will know that there's always a fine balance of pushing the athlete too far or not far enough. And can I, a small, small anecdote, I know time is a problem. Haile Gabriel Selassie broke that world record in Berlin. What people don't know is that two weeks before that, he had a severe injury, he couldn't walk down the stairs from his bedroom. He stopped training completely. We were devastated and the team flew back home. The project was over. He went to Berlin just to actually for the appearance money. He broke the world record. Why? Because he did something he had never done before. He stopped completely, completely tapered and stopped everything because he couldn't walk. He broke the world record. Can you see sometimes you're pushing the athlete to their limit? Sometimes, as you said, Pedro, you get it wrong because we don't have all the technology. Every year we get better. That's why I think moving forward, the Olympic Committee should be, a, and I know you're already doing this, Pedro, is engaging with the engineers and all these different technologies to answer that particular question of that excellent person who asked that question. Thank you. Uh, before going to the next question, only to remind all the participants, we have a, a heat chamber in Portugal and we already have a, a, a fantastic work with some athletes in, in this heat chamber in, in Coimbra. And uh, for example, uh, João Vieira made the, 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 the second place in the world championships in Doha. Uh, in the 50 kilometers uh, race walk. It was an amazing, amazing performance from João. And uh, it was really prepared, prepared before because the conditions were really, really tough. And uh, the time it was, I should say, sorry, João, but uh, I think you agree with me. The time is only, it, it was bad, really bad, awful. However, it was a fantastic time for that condition. So he was really prepared for that. The Olympic champion was out, the world champion was out, and then he is. And um, th this is really important because at the Olympics, maybe, maybe the, 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 the conditions are, are, are really the same or, or, or near that, that conditions. And who is prepared for that conditions is going to win. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure about that. Pedro, Pedro, can I just make a point to support what you're saying? Because you're so, so important. And it goes back to what I went over very quickly. Think of Beijing Marathon, okay? Uh, Wanjiro broke the Olympic record in very hot conditions. What is my point? You can prepare for very bad conditions. So going to Zhao's point of view, the point that you re referred to Zhao, you said he prepared very well. I would say prepare him even better now so that his time's fast. Faster, yeah. you see what I'm saying? Because that is possible. I'm not saying it could be at 100% of running at 11 degrees. I'm not saying that. But you can get very, very close, very, very close. And Wanjiro proved to us that you could even break the record, which we scientists at the time, I was one of them saying, impossible. It wasn't impossible. Yeah. So we can prepare for those conditions. That is the challenge for your, your, your um, uh, world champion. Well, another question from Pedro Leitão. Uh, what's your thought about the amount of maximum dehydration possible to still be able to perform without collapse? Fantastic question. I mean, this is brilliant questions, okay. Uh, and that's exactly what we did with Haile. We pushed him to his limit. We knew that he could accommodate 10%. But for another athlete, we would have destroyed the athlete. It goes back to the individual response. So that's why I'm saying you, this is all has to do with testing in the lab, testing in the field, uh, simulating the, those kind of competition environments you have, using competitions where you can do to try things out and going to your limit. But you can see how it, that goes back to the point that we we're making before, how dangerous it can be. You get it wrong, you have a disaster. That is why uh, we need to, and it goes back to the technology, but we need to use data from Tokyo for the next competition. And hopefully, if, if you have all the technology in the world, 
in the previous, in Doha, for example, and let's say your, your uh, race walker before, you had collected all this amazing data from him. Theoretically speaking, now you can tweak it and get another few percent because now you know where you can start from. Normally, we don't collect anything. And that's why I'm saying having a five-year, eight-year plan, which normally we don't do, but in my projects we do, that's what we need. So we can push people to their limit and know who can tolerate 10% and who can't tolerate 4%. When we hear that people get sick at 4%, it's not wrong. But a lot of people can tolerate 10%. So why give them, why give them to carry fuel when they don't need it? So excellent question. Another question from uh, Carlos Gomes. In what concerns to humidity and temperature, is it really beneficial to have had the Olympic marathons to race and race walks? moved from Tokyo to Sapporo. It seems temperature is cooler in Sapporo by July, August, but humidity is equally high. Yes, uh, and, and I also thank you for the question. Uh, um, it's very, very really important. And I think the, the point that the, 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 the person who's asking the question is making is that actually of the two, humidity is the more dangerous one. Uh, it's the one that we, in my talk as well, if you use, see how many times I use the word humidity, how many times I use temperature? But let me clarify in case I left you the wrong impression. The humidity is the dangerous one uh, because the hu high humidity means that we can sweat, but it doesn't evaporate. So we have no benefit from the sweating. But as the question, the person asking the question said, the humidity is the same. So the, the dangerous bit is the same. The temperature is higher by about four degrees on average uh, in, Tokyo, uh, in Tokyo. So moving to Sapporo is a very good um, uh, outcome. And, and you should be pleased about that because it means that it becomes a situation where, going back to the discussion about preparing for the worst conditions, the worst conditions you're preparing for, okay, you know, you may not have as severe as you would almost certainly have it was in Tokyo. So, um, but keep your eye on humidity because the humidity is the key. Same applies if you're simulating and doing your um, acclimation sessions. Don't just boost up the, it's important that you boost up the temperature, you boost the, also the humidity, you simulate those environments that you're going to be expecting to get. So um, uh, for me, the, the move to Sapporo is a no-brainer. It was the right thing to do. Um, uh, and your athlete should be very pleased with that outcome, um, at least from the performance point of view. Um, about the question of Nunu Correa, where to get the document from uh, Athlete 365 in English, please go to at Athlete 365 uh, uh, website and uh, you will have it. Uh, it's not very difficult to find it. Uh, about uh, uh, João Neto is from judo <laughs> it's a different a different sport and by the way uh, i i'll put the question and i will add a little bit more about is this uh, uh, acclimatization uh, process important also for the other sports the indoor sports especially in a in a olympics uh, environment and context because everybody has to travel a lot and uh, it's not that her hermetical uh, like uh, going from the hotel to the to the gym and coming back from the gym or the the, the, the arena to the hotel it's a little bit different uh, how, 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 what is your idea but before that i will put the question from joao and i thank joao for that uh, what is your opinion about the altitude training for for uh, combat sports and uh, sh what should be the best protocol to, to do it? Fantastic questions, really, really fantastic. Okay, the first question, which is the uh, somewhat easier to answer, which is uh, sports like uh, judo, what do we do? And I, I tried to, in one sense, preempt that question in my presentation saying that um, uh, I would argue that it's vitally important that they also acclimatize um, to the conditions for reasons that you also, Pedro, they mentioned that there are a lot of time will be spent walking around, going to different venues, traveling, etc. And if you're not used to those conditions, you have a problem, uh, which means that, and you know, you'll be training in those conditions or at least going to the arena where you're training. Um, and if you're not used to that, that's losing a few percent, which we cannot afford to do. And keeping in mind that that acclimatization that you will do uh, or acclimation, should I say, is not going to affect you negatively. 
So basically, you know, it'll add something, it won't remove anything as long as it's done properly. So for me, and I hope this is the message as well that, that, that you've sent in, a, in your previous webinar, is that this approach of preparing for those conditions uh, of Tokyo is for everybody. And actually, can I also go one further step? Coaches, it's you, you should be doing it too. Uh, and the support team, anyone who's important to the athlete needs to do it. Because if you don't, if you know the top of your game, you can't support your athlete where he needs it most. So it's for everyone that, that, is gonna, that has a role to play. So that's the first answer, which is an easy one. Uh, Jao's question about the, um, uh, you know, uh, what, what kind of protocol we should be using for the, for, uh, for, uh, you know, for the altitude training uh, for, for these kind of sports is more tricky and difficult. I would argue at this stage that, um, and it applies to all sports, is that you need to evaluate um, and there's a lot of literature on this to help you, or you can even contact me, I'm happy to help you, is how much is your sport cardiovascularly limited? And to put it in a, in a, in a, a bad way that, that is not, mustn't offend anyone, it's just, a, it's just a, a way I often think of things. If you were to, if in that sport, if you were to inject that person with EPO, would they be enhanced in their performance? Would they perform better? And it's, it's for me who's spent my life fighting uh, drugs and sport, the only reason I'm saying that is that if, if you would expect results to be beneficial, then you need to altitude train them, if that makes sense. That's the simple way I look at it. And remember, a lot of the literature on the impact of increasing uh, red blood cells has also seems to be effects on central components, you know, brain function, psychobiological components, and so on. So I would say, again, is these things need to be tested, need to be trialed, but assess your sport. Is your sport compromised? Uh, by not having a high enough uh, oxygen carrying capacity. And that will answer your question. Then to be very specific about, okay, since we make the decision, yes, it's important, what do we do? Um, again, I would say that what is different between acclimation and altitude training is that with acclimation, uh, you got to increase those temperatures for a short period of time. For altitude training, as we know very much, you have to be in those conditions for a lot of time. So basically that makes it a little bit more challenging because often it means that you have to go to a, uh, if you are lucky enough in your country to have, I don't know if, if Portugal, you have these kind of um, uh, hypoxic environments where you can train as well and also live, may, may not have, um, but it's really trying to find the environment where you can spend 16 hours living, sleeping and potentially training. And I've visited a lot of countries like in Japan and also in China where they have got those facilities. So these athletes in, in sports that are not necessarily marathon running or speed walking or, or race walking or anything like that, they are in those environments, training in those environments, and they're beneficial. If you think about it, in the history of doping in sport, there have been many uh, anecdotes and some evidence of, of blood doping in football. I've always been surprised why footballers have never used altitude training. I'm told it's difficult. Well, find the solution. Nothing in life is difficult. I don't understand that the most expensive sport in the world a sport that Portugal is crazy for, and I'm sorry in 2004, Greece beat you in the final. That's, you know, it's one of those things, uh, European final. It's only Fortunately, successful. in 2016, we could, we could beat France in France, so. <laughs> <laughs> my, point, my point though is that, you know, think out of the box. And this is what I've tried to do in today's session. And that's why the questions are so good is, you know, not because, others are not doing things, let them not do it. If it makes sense to you and you, and you put this, this multifactorial approach together, you'll have the success that you need. Excellent question. Thank you. Uh, I will put five minutes for the limit of our, our conversation. Uh, one, one question, it's not that connected uh, so much with the Tokyo preparation. However, it's a very important one. And thank you for Dr. João Paulo Almeida um, for putting it, how many sweat glands have the African athletes for one square centimeter compared with the non-African athletes? Yeah, super question. And I'm, I'm actually so happy Jao mentioned that. Um, um, from, the, from what I, from the, from the literature that I've uh, measured and read is they have a normal distribution curve that's the same as for the rest of the, of the population of the world. You have some individuals on the 80th, 90th percentile most of them in the middle and some on the other side of the, of the normal distribution curve. Same applies to all the physiological responses, whether it's sweat glands, whether it's a bone mass, whether it's fast twitch muscle fibers, slow twitch muscle fibers, 
And it comes back to that point. I, it's why I started my lecture today so much trying to tell you all that whether you're African, Asian, European, admixed, it doesn't matter. What matters or is how you've chosen your parents, how lucky your genetics are. That is, and it doesn't matter on your race or your ethnicity. So, um, uh, and, and, and to prove it to you or, or if someone uh, who, who says, but the, day, the, the anecdotal thing is so clear. 3.6 liters versus 0.8 in those three athletes. And we talk, and now you know who's 3.6. So you know that at least one of the other two has 0.8 per hour. And you can see the point, it's the whole distribution curve. I will challenge any of your coaches to have an athlete in Portugal who's, who sweats as more than 3.6, the highest ever I think recorded. 0 0.8 is, a, is, is one of the lower sides. There's the African range, which is the world range. Nice. Excellent question, I'm so impressed. <laughs> Um, a reminder here from Maria Machado, our, our dear colleague, uh, Didi. In 2017, the New Ze Zealander Jake Robertson won the, the 27th edition of the Lisbon Half Marathon, breaking the African hegemony in this event, which had two Kenyan athletes in the remaining places on the podium. In fact, Robertson has lived and trained since he was a kid in Kenya. Can Any I comments? Add, can I add on that? What yep. you don't know, my dear, is that I was working with him. So when he ran oh. in Lisbon, he was one of my sub two athletes and his brother. Um, you know, so Jake and Zane, and Zane in, in Rio, again, were running for sub two, broke the New Zealand record uh, on the 10Ks that had stood for, I don't know, 30 years or so. Uh, in Berlin, uh, Zane beat all the Kenyans uh, in the Berlin uh, 10K, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you so much. I'll pay you later for that remark, which you didn't know. But that is exact reason. That's the exact reason why I'm saying, ladies and gentlemen, your color doesn't matter. Because what Zane and Jake did, and, was a, and that's why I got involved with them, they did an, a, a, an experiment that never been done before, is take these young teenagers into, into Kenya. And by the way, just, just for an anecdote, okay? I remember them as 16 year olds and 17 year olds. And one of those training sessions that, that Chip Collel track that I showed you, uh, one of them was sitting in the bushes. They're identical twins, by the way. And that makes it even more interesting. Was sitting with lips that were blue. I thought he had actually uh, had a heart attack because it was his first months of trying to train with the Kings and couldn't manage. First years, it was a disaster for them. They were about to give up. Now they are Africanized. And that goes by Africanized meaning that they've, they're used to those conditions. And that's why I'm, I'm stressing this point because it's what the point I tried to make, which is that we forget the importance of altitude, for example, or other aspects, because we go once to Kenya, or once to altitude, find it very hard as you would, and then say, no, this is not for me. Um, so that comment there, I think really addresses the issue that you know we need to be wise, think of the limitations, identify the individual response, and not worry about stereotypical myths, unless it's advantageous to you, you know? So, so I, one final thing about the stereotypical myth is important. Where I did hurt Kenanis' uh, um, Osaka um, preparation was talking to him about jet lag. He had never experienced jet lag. Some athletes don't experience jet lag. You can travel to the US, you can travel to Osaka, you can travel to Tokyo. Some individuals, they're very unique, don't get tired. I introduced him to jet lag, which then he started thinking, oh, oh, uh, uh, and he started facing jet lag. So what my point is, so typical myth sometimes, or the favorites color socks. If it works, support it. If it's damaging, remove it. Thank you. So no more uh, questions about Tokyo. So I, I, I will finish with this one uh, from Hugo Silva. Uh, what is your perspective about the using of new technologies in sport? Do you think the coaches are more and more dependent on technology? And if they are going to be uh, technolo technology coaches? Yes, it's, and this is, I think, uh, Pedro, we need a whole session on this because it's vitally important, very, very important. Because if the end is going to jump right to the end, if the coaches become the slaves of technology, and even worse, 
if we eventually have technology determining the outcome, for me, sport has died. Okay, because basically then it's a bigger problem than the drugs problem in sport that we have in the result. And I went over those papers very quickly. I'm really worried, Pedro, really worried. As someone who's, who spent his career trying to work with sports integrity, I've used technology all my life. I'm, the slides I missed, I was going to show you about the powers of sequencing technology to allow you to individualize the response to the second almost. The problem we have, though, is that a lot of the technology currently, and, I, and, I, and the argument that my work is known in the public domain, take the shoe technology at the moment. It's a problem. It's a real problem because I mentioned before, some athletes, and you know, in, in take of sport of athletics now, where the sponsor is 99% a shoe company. If the athlete is dictated by a shoe that gives him 3%, while his competitor gives him 8%, like the example I used before with, with Kenanisa versus um, uh, Kip Sang, Kip Sang is demoralized. He's got no chance to compete. Then, you, then the, the clever person will say, okay, Yanis, but then if Kenanissa is competing against Elliot, they both have Nike, so they both have the best shoe. No, because what we have now is that one athlete benefits 8%, the other one benefits 5%. You can't get 3% through coaching. You can't get that 3% through anything else. So then you're watching Formula One racing. And Formula One racing, we expect the manufacturing, the, the engineering and having to be, it's an engineering sport. But going to the extreme race walking, going to the extreme uh, marathon running, that is not what we want. And that's why I use the Rio example, um, you know, of the marathon there. You know, what you also may not know is uh, Gibra Selassie, the uh, world champion who ran in, in uh, he was a world champion when he went to run in, in Tokyo, sorry, in uh, Rio the, at the Olympics. He didn't want to use that shoe because it looked strange. He had never used it in training. So he opted not to use it. That's why he didn't medal. Had he made the decision to use it, he probably would have medaled. Is that the sport we want? That's not what we want. So for me, therefore, um, uh, I feel that it's important we educate so that the coaches, uh, those involved in elite sport are aware of, and, and we don't become um, uh, technophobes and be afraid of technology. Me, at the moment, if you look at the media, I'm often attacked in the media that I'm against industry and against technology. How can I, if my whole, I've just set up a company called Human Telemetrics, it's all about technology. And I'm doing it because I want to measure how inappropriate some of these decisions are being made. So we need to protect our sport and I'll stop there because I think it's a very, very key issue. Please adopt the technology. And, and, and final point to make, if you want to compete on a level playing field, as long as this technology is allowed in the sport, you have to adopt them. So even someone like me now, if I hypothetically, in a hypothetical situation, next year, I'm attempting a world record with one of my athletes in a sub two project somewhere, I will use the best shoe available that's, al that's allowed. I'll use the best of everything that's allowed uh, because you have to. Sport is business, it's professional. We have to be professional, but we have to remember the ethics, the morals, the end of the day, it's all about integrity. And I'll end there. I think it's a good place to end. But thank you for that question. It's vitally important. And we need the support of their federations, of the Olympic committees, because I worry that, because at the moment, you, you've seen the rules in terms of athletics anyway, that the shoes that are, that are, let's say, developmental in some ways will be allowed in Tokyo. I worry. That means... That means that competition is going to be dictated by the shoe. Don't we want to see the best athlete? That's what we want. And we want all this technology to allow the best athletes to all be at their best and let the best win. You know, and that's what we want. That's why we get excited about sport. How can we be excited about all? And actually, I don't know that many psychologists listening to this, this uh, uh, webinar. And I want to use an example to final and we'll stop. They're going to show you we, we are destroying athletes. The example of Wilson Kipsang, he's now will go down in history as a drug cheat because he missed three tests. What people don't know is that he was so demoralized by at the time of running with a slipper, his Adidas was a slipper compared to the Nike. He had no chance. Okay. I won't go into the details about the sports ring. It's another thing that he didn't have access to. So he needed to be 10% better than his opponent. 
I'm not saying, and, and he missed the three tests because he had become depressed. He had become an alcoholic. He was living, and I'm saying personal stuff that I shouldn't talk about here, but that's in the public domain. That was the impact of technology of the sport. Is that what we want? No. So we need to protect our athletes, the young, vulnerable people. And so Olympic committees, federations, beware. I know you need sponsorship. I'm not criticizing World Athletics. I know they have limited access to sponsorship. But be wise, because if you open the door to industry dictating the sport, it's a slippery stroke to a place where the athlete doesn't matter. And I know, Pedro, you're passionate as I am. We want to nurture young athletes, the, spy, the next generation. This way, the next generation is who is the better responder to the shoe, to the ball, to whatever. I'm not picking on athletics. It could be the same in skiing, the same in, uh, in all the sports. You know, That is not what we want. Beware, ladies and gentlemen, but don't become a technophobe. We need, and the same with genetic technology. We are scared about genetic technology because of genetic doping. Don't be afraid. Don't push it underground. Let's use genetic technology to catch the cheats because current, current testing doesn't work well enough. <laughs> Don't be afraid. What did we learn from the pandemic, from, from COVID? That we can do amazing things using the best technology and working together publicly, transparently. Today, I'm working with a Portuguese Olympic committee. Tomorrow, I'm working with a Brazilian. Tomorrow, I'm working with a... You, transparency, openness, working together. That's the future. And I think it's a good point to end. That's, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yanis. It was a fantastic way to end, I, I should say. And, uh, well, it was a, an amazing uh, session. We have uh, two hours and 15 minutes. It was supposed to be one hour and 30. And for me, it, it seemed like half an hour or something. It passed really, really quick. And uh, I think for all the, all the, all the audience also. And uh, yeah, it was absolutely amazing. We, we are having also fantastic feedback from the participants. Yanis, uh, for sure, we, we will have the opportunity to, to have you again with us. Uh, for sure, for us, it, it will be for sure, uh, hopefully for you also. And- um, I already accepted the invitation. Obrigado so much to all of your, your uh, <laughs> all the attendees. I really apologize for doing what a teacher should never do. Go over so much material in such a short time, but I knew we don't have much time. The Olympics are tomorrow. Um, you know, we should have been doing a lot of this a year ago. We, I know Peter, you guys have done an amazing job and I want to throw out all these things. I know you have more questions than answers, but that's good. Thank you so much. Uh, I invite you and all the participants to be in the next week uh, with, uh, with the Chef de Mission from the Portuguese uh, delegation for the Portuguese mission in, in uh, Tokyo 2020. It will be Marco Alves, our Chef de Mission and our uh, sports um, medicine director, José Gomes Pereira. They will talk about our mission. So all all of these contingencies uh, during uh, yeah, this pandemic uh, situation we have. What we know from the games, we will tell you what we know from now and what does it mean for our, for our, uh, for our mission. So we are working very hard on this and we want to transmit also to uh, everybody in the, in the mission and everybody in Portugal that wants to, 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 to see the, the, this session. So thank you so much. It was an incredible presentation. Thank you, Yanis. Thank you to everybody. Let's keep it together. See you next week uh, um, with, uh, with uh, Marco and uh, José Gomes Pereira. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Obrigado.